Before we can start solving complicated problems using Newton's second law, we need to get familiar with some of the forces that are going to show up very frequently in, when solving these kind of problems. The first one I want to discuss is the normal force. The normal force is a contact force. That means that it requires direct physical contact between two objects. Second property is that it is perpendicular to the surfaces that are in contact. Third property is that the objects must be pressing against each other for this force to arise. So if you have an object A and an object B and are in contact and we have a couple of forces pressing A against B, then the normal force that uh, B puts on A is the blue vector that you can see there and the normal force that A puts on B is the pink vector that you can see pointing to the right. Both of these forces are perpendicular to the contact surface between them. Now what is the origin of this force? Where does it come from? What, what accounts for the presence of a normal force? The idea is that it arises from the compression of molecular bonds. This is associated with the deformation of both surfaces that are in contact. To get a better idea of this, let me show you a little animation. Suppose that you step on a mattress. It's uh, What we're looking at is the mattress in cross-sectional view and you can see the springs of the mattress. Initially when you start stepping on the mattress the springs are not fully compressed so you, the motion of your body is downwards. As your body is moving downwards then the springs get more compressed and the force that they can put on your body increases as a result of this. When the normal force, which in this case is the force due to the springs that are direct, directly underneath your feet, when that normal falls, force is equal to the weight of your body, then you are in static equilibrium, you're standing uh, in equilibrium on top of the mattress. So in this kind of situation, you can see that clearly that the normal force is due to the compression of the springs in the mattress. Now, in the case of uh, a person standing, say, on a on the floor, concrete floor, or some rigid surface, then uh, you might wonder what what is the origin of the normal force. It might seem to you that the example with the mattress doesn't apply to this case because you can you don't see any springs uh, inside the the cement that are responsible for the force acting on the person, the normal force acting upwards. Well, it turns out that the situation is actually the same, or very, very similar. The reason why is the following. The floor, just like any other solid material, is made of atoms and molecules, and there is an interaction between those atoms and molecules, between those atoms and molecules and their neighboring atoms or molecules. In a solid, that interaction is very strong, and we can think of it as being a sort of a spring the uh, molecular bonds that we've been talking about can be thought of as some sort of a spring connecting atoms and molecules uh, in a material. These molecular bonds are not infinitely strong. What that means is that for any applied force at one atom, those molecular bonds are going to be compressed or stretched by an amount that could be measured in principle. The moment you step on that floor, some of those molecular bonds are going to be compressed, even if by a microscopic amount. To the naked eye, it may seem to you that when you're standing on the floor, there is no deformation, but uh, if you had a precise enough measuring devices, you would find that there is a sagging on the surface of the floor as a result of you applying your weight on it. Those molecular bonds are going to be compressed until the force that they exert on your foot is equal to the weight of your body. At that point there is no more compression and you are standing in equilibrium without motion on top of the floor. Now here's a word of caution because uh, when people uh, cover this material in high school they tend to have the misconception that the normal force is always equal to the weight of the object that is pressing on the surface. This is not true in general. The normal force is only just big enough to keep the object from penetrating the surface on which it is pressing. In some situations, 
the normal force that is necessary to prevent the object from sinking into the ground will be the weight of the object, but this is not the general case. If there are other forces involved in the problem, the normal force does not necessarily have to be equal to the weight. We'll see some examples uh, next. So the problem I want to propose to you is a boxer who has overindulged in donuts right before his fight and when he's in the weighing ceremony where they make sure that the boxers uh, have the weight required to fight in that category uh, he suspects, he fears that his weight is going to be over the limit what he does is that he surreptitiously presses with his hand on a table nearby if his actual weight is 200 pounds and the force of the table on his hand, the hand that is pressing, is 20 pounds, then what is the reading on the scale? Even when solving a problem as simple as this one, it is always good to follow the procedure, the strategy that uh, I gave you before for solving Newton's second law problems. So the first step is always to do a sketch of the situation. So here we have our boxer standing next to a table, standing on top of the scale <coughs> and we're here we have the judge here writing down the weight of the scale and our boxer here is cheating by pressing on the table with his left hand. The second step after you've done a sketch of the situation is to identify the object of interest. In this case we're talking about the boxer, so this is our object of interest. So we have circled it. Once you have identified the object of interest, then you can go to the move on to the third step, which is to make a list of the objects that are in direct contact with the object of interest. What objects are touching the boxer? So from the sketch you can see that the scale, which is under the, underneath the boxer, is touching the boxer, and the table is also in contact with the boxer. So we have two objects that can apply force on the boxer, the scale and the table. After identifying those objects, we can proceed to draw the free body diagram. So here we have started with the we have placed the x and the y axis on the boxer and the force due to the scale on the boxer, we've drawn it with a yellow color and that's the normal force, the normal between the boxer and the scale we're just going to call it n, which is actually the reading that the judge will get from the scale. What the scale shows is the normal force that the scale is applying to the boxer. Another force, of course, because the boxer is near the earth, is the force of gravity. But there is a third force, which is due to the interaction between the table and the boxer. We identify the table as one of the objects that puts a force on the boxer. So that force is placed or is, uh, is applied to the hand of the boxer and we're going to call it N of the table on the boxer, the normal force between the table and the boxer. It is better if you draw this force in the free body diagram. So let's delete the force from the hand and just place it next to the origin of the free body diagram. So that's N of the table on the boxer. So we have three forces, all of them acting in the vertical direction. Once we have a clear free body diagram, we can proceed to write the uh, Newton's second law. The values that, we have be that have been given in the problem are the force of gravity, the weight of the boxer is 200 pounds, and the force that the table puts on the boxer is 20 pounds. Newton's second law for the vertical direction says that the sum of the forces in the vertical direction should be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the vertical direction. The acceleration in the vertical direction is zero because the boxer is neither moving up nor down. It's just staying on top of the scale. So the boxer is in equilibrium, which implies zero acceleration. The sum of the forces in the vertical direction is are the normal force from the scale, the normal force between the table and the boxer, both of them positive and negative the weight of the boxer, the force of gravity. When you add those three forces, your sum should be equal to zero because that sum is equal to the mass times the acceleration, which is zero. From this equation, we get that the sum of the two normal forces 
should be equal to the weight of the boxer, which is 200 pounds. And since the normal force between the table and the boxer is 20 pounds, the answer for the normal force of the scale is 200 minus 20 equals 180 pounds. This is what the judge, if he doesn't notice that the boxer is cheating, would uh, write down as the weight of the boxer. Now let's talk about what I call elevator physics. Let's uh, look at the, um, some of the physics that happens when a person is inside an elevator that is moving. Let's assume that the elevator is accelerating upwards with an acceleration of A. And what I want to figure out here is what is the scale reading. If the person is standing on a scale, say on a bathroom scale, what is the reading on the scale? As pointed out before, the scale reading is equal to the normal force that the scale puts on the person. The first thing to do is to do a sketch of the situation. We have that already there. Second step, as usual, to identify the object of interest. In this case, it's going to be the person. Third step is to make a list of all of the objects that are touching the object of interest. So if the object of interest is the person, then one of the objects that is touching the person is the scale. You might think, well, the cable that is supporting the elevator, that is supporting the person, should have to should be playing a role in this problem. You might think it odd if you don't include the force of the cable. But this is not how you should proceed. One of the most important rules is that the only objects that can apply forces to an object are the objects that are in contact with it. So the cable, the force of the cable, is not applied directly to the person. That means the force of the cable is not going to be included in the free body diagram for the person. If you were drawing a free body diagram for the elevator, that force for sure will be there because the cable is touching the elevator. The object of interest is not the elevator. The object of interest we have identified as the person. So cable should not be included. It's not one of the objects that puts a force on the person. And after we have the list, we can proceed to draw the free body diagram. The free body diagram for the person is quite simple. Since only one object is touching the person, that is the scale, there is one force associated with it. That force should be upwards. And the other force is the force of gravity. We have no forces in the x direction. Once we have the free body diagram, we can write Newton's second law. The force, the normal force between the scale and the person is n, and that is positive. The force of gravity acting on the person is negative, so we put a minus sign, minus fg. And that's the sum of the forces in the vertical direction. It should be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the vertical direction, which is simply the acceleration in the problem. Remember that the force of gravity is equal to the mass times g. We'll talk about that some more later, but for now let's just uh, use that. And uh, using that, we can solve the equation, Newton's second law. Solving for n, which is the scale reading, n is equal to mg plus ma. We can factor the m and get that the normal force is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the elevator plus g. The final step in solving Newton's second law is to check your answer. In solving any physics problem is to check your answer. The answer that we got here is that the normal force is equal to the mass times the acceleration plus g. So let's check whether this result makes sense. In the case of a equals zero, you will get that the normal force is equal to the weight of the person. So this is exactly what you would uh, expect. If the elevator is not moving, then the scale should be, if it's a good scale, it should be showing the weight of the person. Another case worth checking is when the acceleration of the elevator is equal to minus g. That will be the case when the elevator is in free fall. If somebody had cut the cable that supports the elevator, then the elevator and all of its contents will be accelerating downwards with an acceleration, vertical acceleration of minus g. So if we plug that in in our uh, solution for the normal force, we get that the normal force will be equal to zero. So in free fall, the normal force between the scale and the person will be zero. So as far as the scale is concerned, the person is weightless. Now notice that when the acceleration is positive, 
that means when the accelerate when the elevator is accelerating upwards the uh, normal force is bigger than the weight of the person the scale shows a reading that is bigger than the weight of the person when the acceleration is negative smaller than zero when the elevator is accelerating downwards then the weight shown by the scale is less than the weight of the person now let's go back to that case when up to the weightless case when the elevator is accelerating downwards with minus g when the elevator is in free fall we say that the person is weightless not because there is no force acting on the person we know that the force of gravity is still acting on the person that's fg in the free body diagram but we say that it's weightless because all of the contents of the elevator are accelerating at the same rate they're accelerating with an acceleration of minus g so there is no tendency of one object to move with respect to another object if you were in this elevator in free fall and you're holding a, an apple in your hand and you let go of the apple well you are going down with an acceleration of minus 9.8 the apple is also going down with an acceleration of minus 9.8 meters per second squared there is no reason why the apple would appear to be moving with respect to you so after you let go of the apple in front of your face that's exactly where the apple would uh, continue to be as you're both in free fall so from the point of view of the elevator the apple and you and all of the contents and all of the contents of the elevator are weightless now we can do a similar experiment but now we let go of the elevator box from an airplane so now the airplane has a velocity horizontal velocity v let's go the airplane let's go of the elevator box and uh, the motion of the elevator is now parabolic as you know but it still has an acceleration of minus 9.8 meters per second in the downward direction all of the contents of the elevator you and the scale and the apple and everything else is also moving in a parabolic trajectory and they all have an acceleration of minus g once again all of the contents in the elevator would seem weightless the scale would show a weight equal to zero for the person now let's take this step further and use a rocket to put this elevator in orbit around the earth as in previous cases the elevator is only moving under the effect of gravity the only force acting on the elevator and its contents is the force of gravity the earth attracting the elevator so in this case as in the previous ones the elevator is also you can say that it is also in free fall the acceleration of the elevator you the scale and the apple is centripetal and it is close to being equal to g 9.8 meters per second squared it depends on how high you are above the ground but it would be a number uh, close to 9.8 so since all of the contents of the elevator are accelerating in this case they have centripetal acceleration but they all have the same acceleration there is no tendency of, uh, of one object to move with respect to another this means that the inside of this elevator is a weightless environment if this is not an elevator but the international space station we can say that the International Space Station orbiting around the Earth is a weightless environment not because there is no gravitational force acting on it in fact the gravitational force is pretty close to being equal to the force that it would experience if it was on the surface of the Earth but it is weightless because the motion can be considered to be free fall with all of the objects in the International Space Station uh, moving with the same acceleration now let me ask you a question that I want you to answer in owl space. For your surprise birthday party, your friends make you enter an elevator blindfolded. You hear the doors close, and right after the doors close, you get a sinking feeling in your stomach, which is the same as to say that you feel momentarily heavier. If this is the case, can you tell whether the elevator is going up or down? <laughs>